You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Let's open in prayer. Father, we're grateful for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, every day. Every day we're in awe that he would choose us. And it's just remarkable and, and stunning, and we are thrilled to be members of the body of Christ, able to be, to be uh, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and to do your work of the church in the world today. And so we ask you to, to uh, remind us of our responsibilities and to give us... Uh, to keep us in that excitement that was there in the first of our salvation so that we will spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And while we're doing that, Lord, we want to pray for, for those who are fighting fires and for those who are in harm's way and the, the hurricanes and all of the things that are going on. Uh, we know that these are the natural things that have occurred on this planet because of the fall of man, but, but we still know that your hand can move and we trust you to use everything in your body, of, in the body of Christ to... Uh, to the good of those who are called according to your plan. And so we um, commit those folks in the, that part of the country to you, ask for their safety, that you would protect and that you would encourage, and that you would empower the body of Christ in those areas to spread the gospel, especially in these difficult times. And we pray, Lord, that this morning you would open your word to us so that we might honor and obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, let's read all of, well, we're going to read chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, about through... 25. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the dumb idols. By the way, Paul has no problem calling a spade a spade. Can you imagine being a snowflake in the Corinthian church? He just called me a pagan. He said I was a pagan. Okay, moving right along. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God, who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less, any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed up each, the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. <laughs> and if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our unseemly members come to have more abundant seemliness, whereas our seemly members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another." Just a, a couple of things as we, as we begin to dig into chapter 12, verse 11, <laughs> overview. The same Spirit, Paul emphasizes the same God, the same Spirit, the same, 
all the different sects, if you will, of the Christian church that are believers, we all have the same Holy Spirit. We all have the same Lord Jesus Christ. We all have, the, and, and that seems so obvious, we all have the same Father. But sometimes we do not act like it in the, in the body of Christ. And so as Paul is, the, the Corinthians were not acting like it. They were acting like they had something special that no one else had. Actually, there were members of the church that were acting like they had something special. I'm special because I do this. When God was saying, Paul was saying, God was saying through Paul to these people, everyone in the church is meaningful. Everyone has use. Everyone is being perfected by the Holy Spirit to the day of Christ. Everyone, all of them. And the ones that seem to have the less value, they're the ones that are the most valuable. Pay attention, Corinthians, Paul is saying to them. We're going to see that through this next section. That Have you ever heard the old saying, things are not as they seem? Things are not as they seem. In the Corinthian church, things were not as they seemed. And so as we looked at verse 10, which uh, says, gave a, a pretty good list. Paul was finishing out his list finished in this particular section of Scripture, those gifts that the Holy Spirit chose to list here. Uh, to, one, to another, the effecting of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the distinguishing of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. And we talked about the fact that those showy gifts were the ones that were being the most misused in the Corinthian church. And so Paul has a lot to say about them because he has a lot of correction to do in this particular church. And blessed be God, they did get corrected. There is a second Corinthians. But in verse 11, he, he comes back to this, this mantra. I, I, I hate to use that word because it's used incorrectly, but this, this careful characterization of God, of the Holy Spirit. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. And he distributes, lest we forget the sovereignty of God in any situation or any area of our lives, he distributes to each one individually just as you want. No, just as he wills. Let me read that verse without my, con my, my, uh, my interpretation, if you will. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills, just as this Holy Spirit of God wills. The gifts were sovereignly distributed by the Holy Spirit, and there's nothing in this verse or in this section that indicates believers were to pray for or to seek a certain gift. It is the intention of the Holy Spirit that each believer, intention isn't a strong enough word, it is the purpose of the Holy Spirit that each believer has a gift or gifts, and He, the Holy Spirit, makes certain that each believer is provided with one or more the tools, the gifts, to edify and to build up the church. At the end of this chapter, um, Paul encourages the Corinthians to, he says, earnestly desire the greater gifts, the greater gifts. And then he follows that with a statement that he will show them an even better way, which is the introduction to the love chapter, chapter 13. So in all of life, there is a sense of wanting to better ourselves while learning contentment. Aren't those just, can I say it, two sides of the same coin? We're commanded to be content with what God has given us in life. If we are not content with what we have, we will never be content with what we want. However, is it wrong to want to better yourself while learning contentment? And so God says, it's no different here. We are to be to content, even delighted with the gift or gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us. But there may be other gifts that he has bestowed upon us that we have not discovered yet. Um, how often is it in the work world that someone is assigned a particular responsibility, assigned a particular job they signed on to do maybe carpentry work. And in the doing of that work, their, their supervisor sees a skill that he can discern, but that they didn't know they had. Um, and he will invest in that skill and invest in developing it so that that person will do two things. One, better himself and better the supervisor, better the owner of the business, because there's a give and take there. And so, Often, we have gifts that we don't know about. We have abilities that we don't know about. And it's, it's good to be looking for those, to be seeking for those, to better ourselves while being content with what God has given us. Given us. We need to desire, it says, those gifts later on. 
but only in the context of humility and a blessing. What is the gift going to be for? Well, it's going to be to make me money. It's going to be to make me famous, and everybody will like me, and I'll be just the cream of the crop, the cat's pajamas. Do cats wear pajama pajamas? Where did that saying come from? Okay, I, I'm getting off on a rabbit trail. I would be the best, the most important. No. If, if humility doesn't accompany it, then it's not, that's not coming from the Holy Spirit. That is not coming from the Holy Spirit. The Corinthians were seeking the showy gifts in order to, to one-up one another, to show each other up. This is a divisive and a destructive um, act, and it is why this chapter ends with an encouragement to seek, to seek, followed by a teaching on the foundation upon which all of the gifts can be used, and that foundation, I call it the infrastructure of the gifts, is love. It's the gift of the, it's all the gifts of the Holy Spirit function on the foundation that he will give us, which is love, love for one another, love for the Father, love for the Trinity, love for, for the love for the believers, love for the world in the right way. That is the better way that he's going to talk about, the more excellent way. And so we'll leave that to when we get to chapter 13. But just remember that, that this chapter 13 wasn't dropped into 1 Corinthians accidentally. The Holy Spirit guided Paul all the way through 12, talk, talking about the gifts and their use and their misuse. And then he gives him the skeleton. The Holy Spirit provides Paul with the chapter that is this the skeleton upon which all the flesh of the gifts should hang. And that skeleton is love. That's maybe not a great <laughs> metaphor around this time of the year. But nevertheless, all of them function best, function only, uh, when they're founded in love. When the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation according to the Scriptures, the result will be a manifestation of the fruits of the Spirit, which are Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Here we actually have a checklist for those of us who like to put little checklists on our refrigerators. We can say to ourselves, I have a gift. God has given me a gift. It has been given to me by the Holy Spirit himself. He intends for me to use it. When I use this gift, does it result in either short-term or long-term love of the brethren? Does it cause me to love the brethren more? Does it result in an expansion of joy in myself and in the body of Christ? Does it result in bringing peace to those who do not have it? Does it foster patience in me and in others? Is it expressed in kindness? And does it foster kindness in others? When I bring my gift to bear as the Holy Spirit himself intends, do good things flow from it? Does it promote faithfulness? That is an allegiance to, and a love for the Savior. When I am working in my giftedness, am I gentle? When my gift is being expressed, it, it is, is it clear that my gift is under my control? These are some actual biblical ideals that we can strive for when we're exercising the gifts that will result in these fruits, the fruits of the Spirit. These fruits will result in a body that is unified, loving, evangelistic, and obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is proper to make certain that I am exercising my gift appropriately and biblically, and it's proper to have others counsel me when they think I'm not exercising my gift biblically and appropriately. We are to sharpen one another's iron. We are to be about the business of being Bereans and making certain that each of us is, is holding to what the Holy Spirit would have. The Corinthians were not doing this. They were seeking to exalt themselves, which is what unfortunately may happen with the more showy gifts, the teaching, the prophecy, the out front gifts. That's what can happen with those. And it's a very real danger. And everybody needs someone with a shepherd's crook that fits the size of their neck exactly to drag them off stage when that time comes. Everybody needs that. Um, I remember when I first got elected to office, I talked with a friend of mine who's a Marine sniper, and I said, when you see me going beyond the Constitution, please, one shot, temple. He laughed, too. I'm, well, hopefully I didn't do anything to in, elicit his, his uh, service. <laughs> but anyway, we all need to be recognizing, no matter what position you're in, that we're under the authority of the Holy Spirit, and we submit to one another, it says in, as it says in... Ephesians chapter 5, I think it's 
21 or 22. I should have looked that up. I think it's 21. Submit yourselves one to another. That's a true submission. These Corinthians weren't doing that. They were showing off, and it was dividing the body of Christ. It was causing what Paul later calls a schism, where an actual interesting Greek word. You've seen, if you've ever seen any shows where an earthquake happens and a guy's standing here and a crack goes between his legs and he jumps to one side. That's the word. It's a schism. It divides. It wrecks. It tears. It rends. So to recap, spiritual gifts are not the same as natural talents. They are not to be confused with the fruits of the Spirit, although their proper use will result in those fruits of the Spirit. Spiritual gifts are endowed at regeneration, but may not be discovered for years. The best way to discover a gift or a gifts is to be busy about the work of the Lord in your life. Busy doing the things that you are called to do, that you know God wants you to do. <clears throat> Every believer has at least one, some may have several. Some spiritual gifts seem to be more desirable than, than others because they edify the body and not just the person with the gift. And Paul explicitly points this out with the gift of tongues. It edifies the person. It doesn't edify the body. Prophecy edifies the body. And we'll see why when we get to it. Um, the gifts are given by the will and through the grace of the Holy Spirit himself. They are not purchased. They are not prayed for. They are not sought they are not a second blessing. The Holy Spirit doesn't have, he has enough to do. Don't make him have a checklist. One time, when you're regenerated, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit and you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, the filling of the Spirit is a different thing and we'll see that. Spiritual gifts are not the same as the gift of the Holy Spirit. Every believer is given the gift of the Holy Spirit as a regeneration. He is the comforter, the one who comes alongside, the indwelling God in our lives. No, we're not sparks of divinity. We're humans. But indwelling in us somehow through the mysteries that God has provided is the Holy Spirit himself. You have access. You don't need a priest to get access to the throne of God. You have access directly yourself. And he is within you, the scripture says. So he's the comforter. It's not something that comes later. It's not a secondary happening. We are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is something that will happen over and occur time and time again in our lives. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, however, is concomitant or, or coincident with salvation. So now, any questions about that before we get into the list of the gifts? I'm just going to kind of go through a list. And I hesitated to do this because I don't want you to hang a hanger on some of these. These are, it's an overview it's something that may help you understand, oh, that's why I think that way. But be more busy about doing the work of the Lord than about seeking what your gift is in a frenzied way. Let me just say that. So here's the list. The list. And I, I'm going to go through all of them, including the offices. Um, so there's quite a few here. We'll just look at some of these, and we'll talk about them if you have any questions. And I've, if you need to, I have given the scriptural passages where these are, are pointed out. Prophecy. This is the ability to proclaim a message from God. This could involve the foretelling of future events, though its primary purpose seen in 1 Corinthians is forthtelling. One who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouragement, and their consolation. This gift provides a word from God to a specific group, not the normative word of God to all believers. The nearest current equivalent would be spirit-empowered preaching. What happens on a Sunday morning by a, a, a teacher, elder, pastor who is committed to expositing the Word of God according to the Scriptures. The fourth telling will come again, and we see it in the book of Revelation, but there's no fourth, prop, or excuse me, the foretelling will come again in the book of Revelation. Scratch foretelling. The foretelling, the predicting the future. But there's none of that now. There are no prophets in the church today predicting where Hurricane Irma is going to go. I'll tell you where Hurricane Irma is going to go. Wherever she wants. <laughs> I love it. There was one posting on the internet I saw. It, it showed the, predicting, the prediction of Hurricane Irma's track. And it looked like the flight programs from Houston of all the airlines that fly to all the places in the country. It was just 19 million arrows going every different way. And that's, we need to realize that's us. The Father knows where that stuff's going. We don't. Same thing with prophecy. There's no 
forth foretelling now, but there's plenty of forth telling. Service. The ability to clearly, excuse, excuse me, the ability to identify and care for the physical needs of the body through a variety of means. The Greek word for this gift is the same as that for ministry, diakonos, or deacon, but the gift should not be confused with the office. It's, it's, it's seen in Romans chapter 12, verse 7, as well as other places. Teaching. Um, the ability to clearly explain and effectively apply the truths of God's word so that others will learn. This requires the capacity to accurately interpret scripture, engage in necessary research, organize the results in such a way that is easily communicated. Uh, number four, exhortation. The ability to motivate others to respond to truth by providing timely words of counsel, encouragement, and consolation. When this gift is exercised, believers are challenged to stimulate their faith by putting God's truth to the test in their lives. Do you like to encourage others to move forward in their work for the Lord? You could be, that could be one of your gifts. Giving. The ability to... Con now, giving is a... It's just like faith. All of us are to be giving, to be givers. But there are those who seem to have a special unction. It is the ability to contribute material resources with generosity and cheerfulness for the benefit of others and glory of God. Christians with this gift need not be wealthy. Um, my guess is that the widow had this gift that the Lord Jesus Christ talked about, who gave, what did she give? Like a, a two mites, two mites, which today would be like a couple of pennies, a nickel a dime, something like that, while somebody else puts $500 in. And Jesus said, look at that. It's, it's always, always his way. Uh, leadership, the ability to discern God's purpose for a group, set and communicate appropriate goals, and motivate others to work together to fulfill them in the service of God. A person with this gift is effective at delegating tasks to followers without manipulation or coercion. There are some of you in the church, I'm not, a, I'm not that's not me. I like, to, I like to be told where to swing the hammer. I don't want to tell other people how to swing it. Mercy, the ability to deeply empathize and engage in compassionate acts on behalf of people who are suffering physical, mental, or emotional distress. Those with this gift manifest concern and kindness to people who are often overlooked. These are folks that have the ability to sense when other people are hurting. I don't have that ability. My wife does. She can tell. I trust her to help me know. You think they're... You think they're sad? They look fine to me. They're eating a hamburger. <laughs> You're so sensitive, my dear. You know, at any rate, we are all, by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ expressed all of these, and we should, we should strive to express all of these as much as God commits it to us. But there are those who just have a special ability to do things. Wisdom, the ability to apply the principles of the Word of God in a practical way to specific situations and to recommend the best course of action at the best time. The exercise of this gift skillfully distills insight and discernment into an excellent advice. By the way, what do all these presuppose? That's a very broad question, so I'll just throw the answer out there. They presuppose that a person is intimate with the Word of God because that's where we get the knowledge, the ability to exercise these gifts properly. Yes. Oh, that was, thank you, Thomas. Wisdom. It would be wise for me to advance the printer, the, the projector each time. Knowledge, the ability to discover, analyze, and systematize truth for the benefit of others. With this gift, one speaks with understanding and penetration. Some also associate supernatural perception with this gift. I do not. Um, it's, it's possible that, uh, that, well, I'll just leave that. That was in the text. Number 10, faith. The ability to have a vision for what God wants to be done and to confidently believe that it will be accomplished in spite of circumstances and appearances to the contrary. The gift of faith transforms the vision into reality. I want, to con I want to be cautious about using the word vision here. I'm not talking about you wake up in the middle of the night and you receive a vision from God. What I'm talking about is the ability to see, to take things from a blueprint and execute them. You see what needs to be done. You have the ability. Now, I can... Pat, you're a builder. Can you look at a blueprint and picture the rooms? See, I can't do that. It is so frustrating to me. When I was sent to Belize to, to construct some buildings, I was the, I was the head contractor. Ah, they were crazy, man. I had blueprints, 
And I can look at a blueprint and I can build what's there, but I can't visualize it until it's up. It's like I don't have 3D. There's no 3D in here. And, and this is what a, a person with vision has. It's not some word in the, from, coming from the closet. It's the ability to look at what needs to be done and visualize how it can be done and then execute it. That's what I'm talking about. That's faith. Healing. The ability to serve as a human instrument through whom God supernaturally cures illnesses and restores health. The possessor of this gift is not the source of power, but a vessel who can only heal those diseases the Lord chooses to heal. This gift was also a temporary sign gift. Miracles. The ability to serve as an instrument through whom God accomplishes acts that manifest supernatural power. Miracles bear witness to the presence of God and the truth of His proclaimed word. This gift appeared at selected times in history in order to authenticate the messengers that God had sent and is therefore a temporary gift assigned to those particular times. Oh, thank you. It'll be a miracle if I ever get this right. Miracles, I'm sorry. Distinguishing of spirits, the ability to clearly discern the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. With this gift, one can distinguish reality versus counterfeits, the divine versus the demonic, true versus false teaching, and in some cases, spiritual versus carnal motives. Paul did this with the girl who was following after them, saying the, the, the she was a, what was she? She was demon-possessed, and I can't remember what they called her, but she was following after Paul and, and Silas and saying, these men are from God, and they are proclaiming the way of salvation. Her words were correct, but she was a demonically possessed woman doing things in her life that were associated with the dark. And so Paul finally just turned to her and he, he relieved her of the demons and called her out so that people would know that that kind of work is not associated with our kind of work. That took this kind of perception because it, the, her words were correct to Scripture, the distinguishing of spirits. Tongues, the ability to receive and impart a spiritual message in a language the recipient never learned. For other members of the body to be edified, this message must be interpreted either by the recipient or by another person with the gift of interpretation. This gift is also a temporary sign gift that ceased at the end of the New Testament period. 15, the interpretation of tongues. Um, the ability to translate into the vernacular a message publicly uttered in a tongue. This gift may be combined with the gift of tongues or it can operate separately and also was since being part of the gift of tongues ceased at the end of the New Testament period. Apostleship. Ha, <laughs> I got it that time. In the New Testament, there were 12 plus Paul. Some others, such as Barnabas, Andronicus, Junius, and others as well, are called in a lesser sense apostles in that they are messengers of Christ in the early church. You could call believers today, little a, apostles, because we're messengers. This is not to be confused with the office of apostle that was occupied by the, the 12, the 13 men in the New Testament period and which ceased at that time. This is a position of significant authority and responsibility that God gave to those men in the establishing of the church. Some, um, since the requirement for the apostle office of apostle included having seen the resurrected Jesus, Acts chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 9, this office ceased to exist by the turn of the second century, by the beginning of the second century. Number 17 helps. <clears throat> the ability to enhance the effectiveness of of the ministry of other members of the body. This is only the only usage of this word in the New Testament, and it appears to be distinct from the gift of service. Some suggest, and this is just a suggestion, that while the gift of service is more group-oriented, the gift of helps is more person-oriented. Administration. This word, like helps, appears only one time in the New Testament, and it is used outside of Scripture as a helmsman who steers a ship to its destination. This suggests that the spiritual gift of administration is the ability to steer a church or a Christian organization toward the fulfillment of its goals by managing its affairs and implementing necessary plans. A person may have the gift of leadership without the gift of administration. Evangelism. The ability to be an unusually effective instrument in leading unbelievers to a saving knowledge of Christ. Some with this gift are most effective in personal evangelism, while others may be used by God in, a group, in group evangelism or cross-cultural evangelism. Uh, Ray Comfort comes to mind, to me. As a, 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 I don't know if that's what he thinks, but as an expression of this gift. Number 20, shepherd or pastor. Peter was commissioned by Christ to shepherd his sheep, and Peter exhorted the elders in the churches of Asia Minor to do the same. 
A person with this spiritual gift has the ability to personally lead, nourish, protect, and care for the needs of a flock of believers. And in the New Testament times, uh, churches were led by uh, pastorals. They were led by elders. And uh, each of the elders will have specific gifts for which they need to be careful about not trying to overstep their, their bounds in their gift. Um, if one of the pastors has the ability to shepherd, to nourish, to comfort, he needs to do that. If the other has the ability to teach, to, to prophecy, which is essentially scriptural teaching, uh, he needs to do that. All of them can comfort. I, had a, um, I don't consider myself having the gift of the comforting aspect of pastoring, but I had a fellow come into the store Friday, um, very distraught veteran. Uh, and I spent an hour with him. I was really grateful that God didn't send any very many customers in. And uh, I hope he comes back. I, I spent some time with him and, and tried to get him some help. He was a combat veteran. He was suffering from PTSD. I, I pretty carefully made the, I think I assessed that he wasn't a danger to himself or to others. But it was, it was very real. Very, uh, and that's where I, I was wishing that there was some people who I know who have the ability to truly comfort were there with me. Uh, one of them being my wife, but at any rate, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable gift. It's a needed gift. All of us need comfort. All of us need shepherding. Uh, even shepherds need shepherding sometimes. But anyway, though, that's the list. Any questions? So now, that's information for you to use as you're working for the Lord. That doesn't mean we'd stop in our tracks and go, oh, I don't know what my gift is. I'm going to quit serving the Lord. Yeah, did you have a question? No. Okay. Good thing I'm not the auctioneer. <laughs> I saw a hand go up and went, I see that hand. <laughs> All of us need to be busy working for the Lord. There are no pew sitters in the Christian church. There shouldn't be. And all of you, and that doesn't mean that all of you will be up here or all of you will be blah, blah, blah. What it means is that you have a, a particular area of service. And Paul's going to talk about the fact that some of the most important areas of service never get noticed. And that's just not, that's not good. They should be noticed. But unfortunately, they often go unnoticed in the modern Christian church because they are, they are the backbone of the ministry that the out front people depend upon and do their out front thing and never think to give the credit to the actual people who are supporting the ministry that is happening. And we're going to talk about that when we get to it. it. This was such a, this section of study was such a, I mean, I thought I read First Corinthians. I've read First Corinthians, I don't know how many times in the last 40 years. I didn't read this. Was this here? Was the Lord dealing in a different area in my life then? I, the Word of God is, is active. It's like a two-edged sword. I think I read that somewhere. And it divides and it brings us to humility. It, it causes us to understand where we fall short. To repent, God is not a God of just slamming us down. He's a God of lifting up and to recognize where we need to do better and then by the Holy Spirit to do better. So at any rate, these are the gifts and uh, <clears throat> including the offices. And just if anybody wants this information, I can email it to you. Any other questions about verse 11? Verse 12. Four. Even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. This verse is one that Paul has developed in several places in his teaching, and clearly is promoting unity in a church that is struggling with division. Each and every Corinthian, and by extension each and every one of us, is a member of the body of Christ. That body is one as the bride of Christ, and yet marvelously, God deals with each of us as individuals. There are no collectives in the kingdom of God, no, clish, no cliques, no groups. They are, are individuals, and they are one in the body of Christ, all of them. There are only individuals who are believers and who are members of the vast and marvelous body of Christ. The human body is an excellent example to be used in this metaphor. It is composed of distinct parts that all have a unique purpose. Some parts can serve purposes of other parts in a limited way. For example, some of you can probably pick things up with your toes. Wouldn't you rather pick them up with your fingers, though? Doesn't it work better? So, 
it's not nearly as effective as picking them up with your fingers. In the same way, the giftedness of the body of Christ is done on an individual basis with the purpose of unifying the whole body of Christ into one great coherent group that glorifies the Son of God and propagates the gospel and gives praise to the Father and acknowledges the marvelous work of the Holy Spirit. Other places that Paul uses this metaphor are very instructive. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17, he says, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Here Paul is broaching the subject of the Lord's Supper and reminding the Corinthians that they share in the body of Christ, which he provided for their salvation, for our salvation. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. For just as we have just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, and shouldn't strive, um, comment, shouldn't strive for the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. We're all members one of another. This verse is leading up to another discussion of the gifts in Romans, and as such is an excellent commentary on this current verse. Ephesians 4, 4 and 5. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, not multiple. Here Paul talks about all the ones that exist in the church. There are many, many believers, but only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's a unifying thing. It's a blessed unifying thing. For, and then Colossians 2.19 and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, that's all of us, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. The entire body, the church of Christ, grows at his discretion and must hold fast to him. Not the, not the preacher, not the elders, although they have a position, but to him, to him as the king and the head of the church. There are other verses, but these suffice to show that this metaphor was in common use. And uh, it was also in use in secular texts, and as such would have been very recognizable even to the pagan Christi Corinthians who had come into the body of Christ through the ministry of Paul and others. One example is Seneca uh, in his epistles, chapter 95, verse 52. He says, All that you behold, that which comprises both God and man, is one. We are the parts of one great body. Nature produced us related to one another, since she created us from the same source and to the same end. She engendered in us mutual affection and made us prone to friendships. She established fairness and justice according to her ruling. It is more wretched to commit than to suffer injury. Through her orders, let our hands be ready for all the needs, all that needs to be helped. That was from Seneca, one of the uh, uh, Roman, what would you call them? Wise men, I guess. During the plebes revolt in Rome, this analogy was also used by Menenius Agrippa, a fable he recorded to incite the revolt and it was recorded by Livy. He used this to incite the revolt. He used the, the context of the body. He said, In the days when man's members did not all agree amongst themselves, as is now the case, but each had its own ideas and a voice of its own, the other parts thought it unfair that they should have the worry and the trouble and the labor of providing everything for the belly, while the belly remained quietly in their midst with nothing to do but enjoy the good things which they just bestowed upon it. They therefore conspired together that the hands should carry no food to the mouth, nor the mouth accept anything that was given it, nor the teeth grind up what they received, while they sought in this angry spirit to starve the belly into submission. The members themselves and the whole body were reduced to the utmost weakness. Hence, it had become clear that even the belly had no idle task to perform and was no more nourished than it nourished the rest by giving out to all parts of the body that by which we live and thrive when it has been divided equally amongst the veins and is enriched with digested food, that is, the blood. Drawing a parallel from this to show how like was the internal division, dissension of the bodily members to the anger of the plebes against the fathers, he prevailed upon the minds of his hearers. So Livy commented that using this analogy, he prevailed upon the minds of his hearers to revolt. <laughs> Interesting. So the body analogy was in common use at the time. It would have been understood by the church at the time. It's, it's an analogy we can all understand, isn't it? It's a good analogy. Uh, just as Christ is one, finishing up this morning, so his body, so is his body. 
even in all of its wondrous diversity of individuals. We are here in this body, we here in this body are also very different, and so should it be. For if we are all alike, then most of us would be unnecessary. God has a work for each one of us to do. Have you ever thought, don't know hands or anything, <laughs> but have you ever thought to yourself, I don't have any use? Not true. Everyone has a use, a blessedness in the body of Christ. Everyone. And that will be woven into the whole work that he is doing into the world. in the world. Each and every one is necessary to that work. And Paul was telling the Corinthians that the direction and value of the body was comprehended both in its unity and in its diversity. And it's funny that, that people think that they've got a, a, a market, they've cornered a market on these words, diversity. Paul was using them 2,000 years ago in their proper context. We're a diverse group, but we're unified in Christ himself. And that is the only place I submit the true unity can flourish, can blossom, and can be useful in the world. Unity in anything else will dissolve. But when unity is a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of Christians, a result, then what comes out of it amongst those Christians is the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, no one has yet passed a law. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you thought of everything that was necessary for us to be about the work of doing to be about doing the work of Christ in this world. And so might we today, with our giftedness, and as we learn more about ourselves, remember how to serve you, push forward in serving you, in honoring you, and that will most evidently be in how we treat one another in the body of Christ. Let us be about the business of loving one another and building the unity that the Corinthians were so sorely lacking and that is often lacking today. Thank you for your gift of the Holy Spirit, which was bestowed at salvation and that we have. Let us be filled with the Spirit and do those things that you call us to do. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, Thank you for listening.